That was awesome. You pray with me. Oh, Father, how blessed we are to be drowning in the ocean of your son's love for sinners. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That alone is just staggering to us, Lord, that you would love so much that you would send your son in this manner towards us to save us. And we rank ourselves among the foremost at the top of the list because we know our rebellion against you. We know we are not worthy of this love. You do not charge us to merit it. You freely gave it, and we were saved. Lord, thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his great name that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Let's take our Bibles and open them this morning to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 8. While you are turning there, I'll remind you a little bit of our summary of this letter. How do you summarize 16 chapter letter like this? Paul's great treatise on the gospel. Here's what we've been saying. The gospel will establish us. That's the first thing we need to be thinking about when we think of Paul's letter to the Romans. The gospel will establish us, then endear us to the expansion of the gospel. So the gospel will establish us, and then it will endear us to the expansion of the gospel. This is Paul's hope for the church in Rome. He, as he writes this, is actually aiming west of them. He's aiming for Spain with the gospel. The eastern Mediterranean world has been sufficiently covered by him to his satisfaction, he says in chapter 15. Now, certainly there will be more done in the eastern Mediterranean world by others, but Paul is ready to head westward. And Rome is an interesting case for him, an interesting church for him. The church in Rome was not planted by an apostle, nor had it had an apostle visit it as of Paul's writing in AD 56. So Paul wants this church to partner with him in his mission to Spain, but it has not had yet a direct apostolic building up given to it. So Paul's plan is to write to them and unfold every rich dimension of the gospel that he can. And as they grasp its deepest dimensions they will become established in that gospel. And as they see that solid gospel foundation under them, as they see it undergirding them and strengthening them, they will only want to see that amazing gospel go in ever-widening circles beyond them to the ends of the earth, and in particular, Spain. This idea of establishing um, them in the gospel is found in Romans chapter 1, and we're going to see it in our passage today, verse 11. Paul says, I long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gift to you so that you may be established. And he says, verse 15, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you. This is how he is going to establish them. The same thing is said in chapter 16, verse 25. It just comes right out and says it. Paul says it there. Now to him who is able to establish you or strengthen you according to my gospel, the gospel that had been entrusted to him by Jesus Christ, that he was to go and preach. So there's the idea in the bookends of the letter that this is supposed to establish the Roman believers. The idea of endearing them to the mission is found in chapter 15, verse 24. Paul says, whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. Chapter 15, verse 28, therefore, when I have finished this and have put my seal on this fruit of theirs, he's talking about his trip to Jerusalem and the gift from the Gentile churches to the church in Jerusalem. When he has finished that, I will go on by way of you to Spain. This letter is Paul's missionary support letter. It is the most amazing missionary support letter you will ever read. And its enduring effect is the same on all who study it. Paul wanted the Romans to be established and then endeared to his gospel mission to Spain. As we study it, we will be established in the gospel and we will be endeared to the gospel mission continuing to expand to the 
ends of the earth. Paul writes in chapter 1 his longest introduction of any of his letters because he did not plant them. He does not know them except for those named in chapter 16. His introduction breaks down into two parts. Last week, we looked at verses 1 to 7. Today, we're going to look at 8 through 15, and I want you to see the difference between 1 to 7 and 8 to 15. How are they different? I want you to listen carefully to the I statements that Paul makes, where they are and where they aren't. Okay, I'm going to read 1 to 7, and you listen for those I statements. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his namesake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Not one I statement. He's very official in verses 1 to 7. Paul has an official connection with Rome because of what God has made him as an apostle to the Gentiles, to the nations. Now listen to our passage today, verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of the Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Now, what is Paul trying to accomplish with that avalanche of I statements in verses 8 to 15? He just turned his introduction of himself from something official to something personal. Verses 1 to 7 have an official apostle tone. Verses 8 through 15. Uh, 15, have a personal apostle tone. It's very self-revelatory. He's revealing himself personally to them. They must not only feel his official connection to them because he's an apostle of Jesus Christ, but they must also feel his personal connection to them as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And the Romans here early on catch a personal glimpse, their first, of the apostle Paul and his heart for them. And so this is why he does not just rush into the theme verses of his entire letter, which are verses 16 and 17. This is why he lingers just a little bit longer introducing himself. These two parts of his introduction need to snag the Roman readers and entice them to keep reading and ultimately to endear them to partner with him on his mission to Spain. So in this very personal part of his introduction, Paul displays three virtues, three apostolic virtues that will do just that. So what is this passage all about? You can see it up on the screen there. Paul displayed three apostolic virtues that endeared the believers in Rome to his mission in Spain. Three apostolic virtues will endear the believers in Rome to his mission in Spain. So let's start. Number one, Paul was prayerfully ingrained toward the Romans. Prayerfully ingrained, verses 8 to 10. Let me summarize these three verses for you first. Paul did not know this church at all, minus the names in chapter 16. So what kind of prayers could he pray for people he didn't even know? I mean, were those kind of superficial, shallow prayers like, God, just bless them. 
Or was there something more of substance to them? What will they find out is that he, was well, he has a well-worn path of prayer to God concerning them. This apostolic virtue, when they hear it, it's going to endear them to Paul, who is planning to get to Spain with the gospel. So let's take a look at verse 8. He says, first, and if you keep reading in Romans, you will not find a second. Paul does something similar in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, but Paul's not thinking of a longer list of really important items to address, and he's now ready to start working through them one by one, and here's the first one, by the way. What he means by first is this is the prominent item on his mind right now he, that he thanks God for all of the church. Listen, when a man says, my family comes first, you don't necessarily automatically think, well, to ask him, well, what comes second? He's just saying, the above all thought in my mind is my family. And that is what Paul says here. Thanking his God occupies that prominent place. And by referring to God as his God, my God, Paul reminds us of how personal our relationship is to be and actually is with God. God is not some distant, removed deity. He's my God. Paul belonged to God, and God belonged to Paul. And notice who he does not thank for the Romans' faith. He doesn't thank the Romans for it. That is because God gives faith by his grace. And so if the Romans indeed possess faith in God, Paul must thank God for giving it. And Paul was careful to not forget that the only way he can prayerfully even approach God about anything, even as an apostle, is through the one and only mediator between him and God. That's Jesus Christ. I thank my God through Jesus Christ. And Paul's thankfulness is not conditioned upon his personal knowledge of, Roman, of the Roman believers. Well over 30 of them are mentioned in chapter 16. Paul isn't thankful just for the portion of the church that he does know. Paul's thankful for all of them. And the reason Paul thanks God for all of the Romans is that, verse 8, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. A little use of hyperbole, right? What an encouragement to Paul. Think about this. Just stop for a moment. Think about the Apostle Paul. He had been all over the Eastern Mediterranean world, and everywhere he went, he went to the Jews first in the synagogues, right? And everywhere he went, he first came up against their stubborn disbelief. And they chased him from one town to the next town to the next town. So whenever he heard of genuine saving faith, he thanked God because he knew that God had done it. He's thankful. And notice their faith was not whispered or murmured or spoken softly. Their faith was being proclaimed, launched verbally. And take notice that their faith was not proclaimed in an abandoned alleyway in some obscure neighborhood in Rome, but indeed throughout the whole world, wherever Paul went, like Corinth, his second missionary journey, Acts chapter 18, and Priscilla and Aquila come from Rome. He hears about the faith of the church in Rome. Wherever Paul went, somebody boldly spoke about their faith, saying something like, have you heard of the faith of the church that is in Rome? Wherever Paul crossed the Mediterranean world, church after church was encouraged to proclaim, to proclaim that a, a church existed in the imperial capital city. But surely more is being said here than just faith exists in Rome. This implies that the church's faith had been of a quality or a, of a boldness worth proclaiming. And the result for Paul was that he prayerfully thanked God for them. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. That's the first thing that holds prominence in my mind. Now, verses 9 and 10 reveal more of Paul's prayer life regarding the Romans. Look at verse 9. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests 
If perhaps now at last by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. Paul calls God as his witness before the Romans. In regards to what? Well, what God has seen. What God has witnessed that Paul wants the Romans to hear about? How he's been praying. Now just stop for a moment and think about that. (laughs) You know what God has seen in your prayer life. Would you want to call him to witness? To the witness stand and speak? It's very humbling. It says something about the Apostle Paul and what he thought of prayer. What has God seen? Verse 9, how unceasingly I make mention of you Romans. Well, concerning what? Verse 10, always in my prayers, making requests. If perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you. So in verse 8, in prayer, Paul gave thanks to God for their faith being broadcasted everywhere. And now in verses 9 and 10, in prayer, Paul always asked God if he could get to the Romans. It's important for Paul that the Romans know he prays unceasingly, not sporadically. And that the one who has heard those prayers can actually testify to their enduring nature on Paul's behalf. And that's God. And Paul says he serves that God in his spirit in the gospel of his son. The word serve there is interchangeable with worship. Those two ideas go together in this word. Paul is a worshipful servant of this one who has seen his prayer life, or he's a servant worshiper of this one who is a witness of his prayer life. And Paul's worshipful service takes place in the realm of the gospel of God's Son, and Paul's inward man, his inward self, his spirit is involved and engaged in this worshipful service. Paul has that kind of relationship with the witness of his prayers. Well, well, what about Paul's petitions to come to Rome? What were they like? Well, notice in verse 10, he didn't pray once and God answered the prayer. He didn't ask once and then all of a sudden found himself on the greased slide to Rome. Paul had to unceasingly pray and make mention over and over of his desire to see them. And so that means that there was not an immediate answer. And he'll say more about that soon. And Paul fleshes this out more in verse 10. He says, in every prayer, uh, always in my prayers, making requests. That means in every prayer or in every prayer time that he had, Paul included in those prayers requests that he might be able to get to Rome. He, He did that in such a manner that he could say, always in my prayers... I am making request of God to get to you. What does that say about how badly Rome is on his mind? It occupies every prayer. Let's pause for a moment. Just think about this. How do we do at keeping on in prayer, in a prayer request, when the answer doesn't come immediately? I mean, we're the culture that has trouble waiting for our video to finish buffering. He kept pressing God for it. But in accordance with God's will, verse 10, he didn't want to get to Rome apart from God's will. He's the slave of Jesus Christ. Remember chapter 1, verse 1? So he is only interested in God's will in getting there. And if he only knew how bizarre the details of God's will actually would end up being for him in getting to Rome as a prisoner, through a terrifying shipwreck, after being forgotten in prison for two years in Caesarea, and then living under house arrest in Rome for two years. Well, God was willing, just not in any way anyone would have ever thought. So, in verses 9 and 10, this reveals Paul had a well-beaten path of prayer to God, which was the path of, full of making requests to get to Rome. And this precious virtue in Paul endeared him and endeared his mission to Spain to the Romans. 
I mean, imagine, they could say, say things upon hearing this, like, he's heard of us? And, and through so many others, he's heard of us. He's thankful for us. And he can't stop asking God for an opportunity to, to come to us? Do you think they wanted to keep reading? Do you think they wanted to keep hearing this read to them? That virtue made partnership in the gospel ministry enticing to them. Uh, let's pause on this just a little bit longer. Prayer took Paul to the Romans long before his preaching ever did. Long before his teaching ever did. And, and we saw this, and, and we still see this even with our endeavors in our gospel endeavors in Papua New Guinea. Um, the Dodds and the Cans and the Laymans and, and so many more of us, we, prayer took us to the Finister mountain range of Papua New Guinea long before we ever picked a tribe or God chose it for us. And prayer is still leading the team to this tribe before they ever start teaching or preaching the gospel to them. And that's good for the missionary to remember, isn't it? That prayer needs to take us to our audience long before our lesson ever does. It's good for a preacher to remember. It's good for a mother to remember who's going to train her children each day. It's good for a father to remember as he's prepping for a family devotional. It's good for an, an NGM worker who's preparing for next Sunday let your prayers of thankfulness and your petitions take you to those long before you ever teach them. Let a well-worn path of prayer precede your discipleship and your instruction and your preaching. Spend more time talking to God about them before you actually talk to them. And it's safe to say that even the for the Apostle Paul, who went about preaching the gospel everywhere, that he reached more by prayer than he did by his preaching. The first apostolic virtue that Paul displayed was that he was prayerfully ingrained toward the Romans. And how endearing that was to find out. The second apostolic virtue, number two, Paul was personally invested in the Romans personally invested in the Romans. Now, let me summarize these three verses, 11, 12, and 13. What we learn about Paul in this section is that he can't send Timothy and he can't send Titus in his place like he did many times elsewhere on his missions. Paul doesn't want to invest another man's skill set or another man's giftedness in the Roman church. He must do it. He must do it. This apostolic virtue that, that Paul will only personally invest himself in them, that will endear them to him and to his gospel mission. So let's examine more closely now verse 11. Verse 11, Paul builds on the remark at the end of verse 10 about wanting to come to them. He says, verse 11, for I long to see you. Literally, he says, I am homesick for you. I'm homesick for you. Paul feels already like they are his home. His home even though he's never been with them yet. And Paul's homesick to see them for this purpose, so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, verse 11. But what does Paul mean by that? Well, it's not just any kind of gift that they will benefit from, but it is one that is spiritual in nature, um, from the Holy Spirit. What other kind of gifting would Paul want them to benefit from? But this gift is in a class by itself from the other gifts because Paul says, the apostle, that he will be the one imparting it. 1 Corinthians 12 makes clear that the Holy Spirit gives gifts to whoever he wishes. So what gift then is it that Paul will impart to them? It must be one that is tied specifically to him and his apostolic calling and his apostolic office. Remember in verse 5 of chapter 1, through whom, through Jesus Christ, we have received grace and apostleship. And I think the best way to understand that is that we apostles have been graced with apostleship. We were gifted with apostleship. One says this, spiritual gift does not refer to the gifts of 1 Corinthians 12, but 
to such operation of the Holy Spirit when Paul, with his message, should come among them as would enlarge and settle them in their faith. Paul knew that there was in him, by the grace of God, peculiar apostolic power by both his presence and the ministry of the word to impart a gift, a spiritual blessing. And what will be the purpose of this spiritual gift among them? Verse 11, that you may be established. These who have a faith of such a quality already that it is being proclaimed around the Mediterranean world, these, according to Paul, need his gifting still as an apostle in order to take their legitimate faith and what? Strengthen it. Like a young tree that's been planted benefits from being staked as well, right? So their faith needs Paul's apostolic gift set to strengthen them. Remember, no apostle founded this church, nor had yet visited them. And Paul knows far more about what they are in Christ as the church than they do. And he must bring his apostolic grounding to them. And Paul won't send Timothy to do it, or Titus. He personally must come himself and invest himself in them. In particular, then, what is this that Paul will impart to them that will strengthen them? We've talked about this. I believe it's the gospel. He spells that out in verse 15. I am eager to preach the gospel to you. I want to impart a spiritual gift to you that will strengthen you. Chapter 16, verse 25. May my God establish you according to my gospel. So Paul actually begins the imparting of that gift to them by this letter. The multifaceted and rich and deep gospel which he was entrusted with will be imparted to them in his apostolic writing and then with his presence. And in so doing, they will be established and therefore ready to help him get the gospel to Spain. And Paul is so humble and eager to not be seen by them only as an official high and exalted apostle, but also just as an equal believer with them. Look at verse 12. Verse 12 qualifies his intent among them. The benefit will be mutual, he says. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you, while among you, each of us, by the other's faith, both yours and mine, over and over, he's talking about me with you, yours and mine, together. Very humble man. And again, nearly everywhere that Paul went on his missionary journeys, he was obstructed by Jews who refused the faith that was the basis for declared righteousness. Instead, the Jews trusted in their own works righteousness over and over and over. And over and over, Paul had to work through the conflict of exposing that and then putting his life in jeopardy in so doing, only to be rejected by them. And so when Paul comes across faith like this, saving faith, the faith of the gospel that faith which helps the gospel then reveal the declared righteousness of God, verse 17. Paul found great encouragement by that, and he wanted to put his faith up against that faith and get the benefit. He wanted his own faith to rub up against that faith in others because it was strengthening even to him, the apostle. Paul was homesick for the Romans to get this personal encouragement for himself as well. He was personally invested in them before he ever got to them. Listen, in our fellowship with each other, great benefit comes to us when we intentionally draw out from one another faith in Christ, accounts of our faith in Jesus, our ongoing trust in Christ, in the face of life, in the face of ministry, in the face of danger, in the face of trials in this world that hates Christ and hates us. We mutually build one another up when we hear of each other's saving faith. Paul believed that. Do you? And Paul benefited from that. Are you? Are we? Let's labor and draw out those accounts of God's saving faith in our lives.
There's one more personal item about Paul that the Romans must not be unaware of. He hinted at it in his unceasing prayer before, but now he's ready just to let it hang out there completely in verse 13. Since his time with Priscilla and Aquila, at least in Corinth, in Acts chapter 18, which is around AD 51, and he writes this in AD 56, so for probably five years at least, he has actually planned to come to them. Verse 13, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you. But he had been prevented, he says in verse 13, and have been prevented so far. Well, by what? Well, when he writes this, he's on his second missionary journey. He's in Corinth. Or he's in, th- he's in third. Uh, he's, in, he's in Corinth at the end of his third missionary journey. He still has more to do to try to accomplish. More gospel ministry elsewhere. Getting to Jerusalem. Getting to other places hindered him. Gospel ministry prevented Paul's gospel ministry to Rome. Gospel ministry kept him from gospel ministry to Rome. What was his plan when he got there? To obtain some fruit among you also, verse 13. That's a humble statement, just some fruit. What is meant by this fruit? Well, the obtaining of this fruit in Rome will be in the same vein or the same manner of his prior gospel encounters among the rest of the Gentiles. Look at verse 13. So that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as, just like I did among the rest of the Gentiles. Well, what kind of fruit was that? A very broad, ranging fruitfulness. I think it's from conversion of sinners to the strengthening of believers. In Acts, which did Paul give himself to? The conversion of sinners, did he want that fruit or did he want the fruit of establishing believers? And we don't even want to ask that kind of question because it pits two things against each other that were never intended to be pitted against one another. In Rome, he's not only hoping for conversion when he comes or only for strengthening of the church, he aims for the whole gospel ministry fruit in Rome that he was familiar with getting everywhere else he had been. And if he gets some, he'll be happy. Now let's go back to a moment to the thought of perseverance in gospel ministry. Paul wanted gospel ministry that was good. That was good. The the gospel ministry that was Rome-focused, but Spain-centered, right? He wanted to get to Spain. But he was prevented from that, often. By what? Probably his third missionary journey and other good ministry endeavors that were on the front burner. And we need to have a category for this as a church. I think we've actually experienced this as a church in our past and even present. There are times where we've dreamed and planned and wanted things and gospel endeavors, good gospel endeavors, but that we just were not able to get for years. Why? Well, because perhaps there were other more urgent gospel endeavors, more immediate or basic, or primary gospel endeavors that needed another three to five years of effort yet, full attention. But Paul kept pressing. Why? Because his aim was as wide as his apostolic calling. He was called to the nations. He kept trying for what he was called to. And do you find that interesting? God called him to the nations. He's trying to get to the nations, but he's prevented. Do you have a category for that? That that happens in a church's ministry, in its missions attempts? He was trying to get to new Gentile lands, new Gentile opportunities. Now imagine if Paul was discipled more by our instant gratification culture than he was influenced by the gospel mission. We'd be in trouble. And what's the benefit? What's the benefit for us that Paul was actually prevented over and over and over and over? What's the benefit for us? What if he had gotten there right away? The fact that he was delayed, what do we have? We have Romans. We have this letter. So in waiting and not getting what you want, there might be some real blessing in it for us as well. This apostolic virtue of being so personally invested in them, it surely endeared them to him and his mission to Spain. 
And his mention of his fruitful labors in verse 12 among the rest of the Gentiles leads us to Paul's last apostolic virtue. Thirdly, Paul was predictably indebted, predictably indebted to his mission. Verses 14 and 15. How would we summarize these two verses? Well, what Paul was obligated to in verse 14, I am under obligation, both to Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. He was so indebted to, it was the very same thing that he was eager to do with the Romans also. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. To preach the gospel, that's that special word that takes the good news as a noun and turns it into a verb of sorts. To gospelize you also. The Romans can be assured that when Paul's not going to come to them with some new trendy philosophy of ministry that he was just now trying out after attending a really cool gospel conference in Athens. If the Romans could only know about the long, laid-down, gospelizing track that Paul had been running on prior to them in all other Gentile places he had ever been, they would be able to predict that what he did there is what he'll do with us. He was predictably indebted to the gospel mission. So let's take a look at verse 14. Paul feels a great burden of debt for being graced with this apostleship that he got. God has put on him by his grace this nation's sized calling. And he must discharge it. He's bound to it. Discharge it to whom? Look what he says. I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Notice these interesting classifications among the Gentiles. In verse 14, Greeks. Greeks were those in the empire who adopted Greek culture. They were the cultured people. The barbarians, not so much. They were everyone who had not adopted Greek culture, and therefore, they were not engaging in it. And the wise mentioned here probably doesn't carry all of the same tones with it as Paul loads it with in 1 Corinthians 1. It, it just means those with excellence of thought to, according to worldly standards. And therefore, the foolish were those among the Gentiles who weren't as educated, perhaps the, the simpletons. And Paul is obligated He's indebted to his apostolic gospel mission in such a way that he has to go to all of them with the gospel, no matter how they're classified. Where do these cultural categories come from? Where do these cultural divisions, distinctions come from? Paul didn't make them up. The gospel did not cause him to classify people this way. They were first century Roman, self-imposed, self-declared cultural divisions. And by the way, how do you think the Greeks felt about the barbarians? You think they had them over for lunch? Vice versa. They looked down on one another. They envied one another. One was privileged, the other one wasn't. How about the wise and the foolish? How did they view one another? The cultural elite, the cultural sophisticated and educated are, are pitted against the have-nots by the culture. So how did Paul view these cultural dis constructs? Well, he, he's obligated to whatever distinctions exist. He's just obligated to whatever distinctions exist. Whatever culturally created sensitivity that was there or insensitivity that was there, Paul really didn't, made no difference to him. Why? Because Paul took his cues from the gospel and from his apostolic mission. He didn't take his cues from the culture. If he did, he would come to Rome and he would try to help the Greeks see their privilege over the barbarians. Paul isn't interested in either category as the culture defines and divides them. His ministry is not taken up with trying to get the barbarians to get into the shoes of the Greeks or to get the Greeks into the shoes of the barbarians or to get the wise into the shoes of the fools or the fools into the shoes of 
the other one. What is Paul interested in? He's going to get them into Christ through the preaching of the gospel. Paul is indebted to all supposed classes. The culture can't come up with a class that could keep Paul away from them with the gospel, nor could the culture come up with a class that could make Paul play favorites with one to the neglect of the other. This is so important to understand. The gospel mission, his apostolic mission, did not lead him to embrace these or to try to validate those cultural divisions of his day. He acknowledged they existed. But it made no difference to him as one who had been set apart for something different, the gospel. We live in a day where our culture wants to divide us into as many opposing, inflamed parties as possible. There's the left, and there's the right. There's the 1% and the 99%. There's the coastal elite and the flyover simpletons. There's the academy and the fools. There are the legals and the illegals. There's nationalists and globalists. And Paul is so helpful. He didn't get sucked into these kinds of cultural creations. He didn't take his cues from these kinds of cultural distinctions and then put some kind of a gospel hyphenated spin on it. He took his cues from his Lord and King, the Son of God with power. And he went out and he called barbarian and Greek and wise and foolish. He called them all to obey the gospel by believing in Jesus Christ. That's what he did. Paul's ministry as a, as a gospel preacher was not a validation on these cultural distinctions. His ministry was an obligation to all sinners regardless of distinction. And we must be people, wherever we are in society, to meet those people where they are at in society, no matter how society divides them or labels them. And listen, they will be wearing a label. We could acknowledge that. But we need to be more driven and more obligated to preaching the gospel than to accepting or trying to validate the distinctions that are gospel-less. They didn't come from the gospel mission. We need to step into our divided communities and preach the gospel to them and invite them and command them to repentance and faith. And then our divided community can see something brand new, a new community. The church that is united in Jesus Christ. A church that is no longer interested in cultural animosity laced divisions. Didn't Paul say this? Galatians 3. For you all are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Our culture doesn't need to see the barbarians win or the Greeks surrender. They need to see that we are all one in Jesus Christ by the gospel. Paul was indebted to all regardless. Verse 14, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. And therefore, he was ready. So for my part, I am eager. I am ready to do the exact same thing in Rome that I did everywhere else. Paul is predictable. He's predictable. He's not bouncing from one trend to another. His ministry never changed. His preaching never changed. Listen, what he was in Galatia in his first missionary journey is what he was on his second missionary journey in Corinth, which is what he was in Ephesus on his third missionary journey, which is what he will be in Rome. 
He is eager. He is ready to gospelize. The thing that comes to mind is uh, the game of baseball, the batter comes up, and he, ste- he doesn't step into that box immediately. He gets himself all squared around. He thinks, when I step into that box, I have to be ready. And so the minute he steps into that box, he is ready. He lives in that box for that moment. That's the Apostle Paul. He is in the gospel batter's box because it's coming, and he's scanning for the hand. He's scanning for the ball coming off of the hand and the spin on it. He's watching. He's waiting. He's ready to swing. Paul didn't wake up and think and find himself halfway through the day and realize, man, how did I miss that opportunity? He got up and he was ready because God put him into readiness. Do you live that way? Do you want to live that way? You have to live that way as a Christian. You don't want a gospel opportunity to whiz past you only to say, I I, I wasn't ready. You're in the batter's box. We all are. By Christ's doing, that's where we live. Keep your eye on the gospel ball coming your way. Paul was predictably indebted to this apostolic mission, and that brings comfort. Listen, that brings comfort to established Christians. Trends and shifts and changing brands, that attracts window shoppers. But established Christians want and they need and they find endearing an apostle or a preacher or a church that doesn't blow whichever way the wind blows. Paul was prayerfully ingrained. He was personally invested. He was predictably indebted. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you, 2,000 years ago, laid a nation's-sized gospel commission on a man, on a dozen men. And this one apostle, on top of those 12, Paul, was known as the apostle to the nations, and he in particular, he felt the burden of that. And he did not get to the desert southwest, and he did not get to Italy, and he did not get to the Finister mountain range of Papua New Guinea. That nation's size gospel commission still lies before us. He didn't get into our neighborhoods, in our families, in our classrooms, in our workplaces. Father, help us to feel, not that we are apostles like Paul was, but help us to feel the nation's sized gospel gospel commission that still is upon us and will be until our king comes for us. So help us pray more. Help us to prepare better through prayer first. And put it on more hearts that they would want to personally invest themselves in the great commission that they wouldn't be content for someone else to go do it in their place, but that they would have to do it. Father, give us a deeper sense of the magnitude of our debt. Now, we don't have to pay anything to be saved. You paid the price through your son's blood. But we have a currency to discharge against our debt, which is this nation-sized gospel commission. Deepen our debt to gospel preaching such that we will always be discharging it, paying, paying, preaching, preaching, until the world knows Christ. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.